The inspiration for a good song can come from the most unlikely places, like a boy on a dance floor telling his girl not to step on his fancy footwear. What Carl Perkins saw on a crowded dance floor one night not only inspired a song and launched a career, but helped give birth to an American musical art form. Well, it's one for the money, two for the show, three to get ready. Now go, cat, go, but don't step on my blue Well, you can do anything but lay off my blue To me, he's the king of rockabilly. The fact that he played guitar and sang and wrote kind of set him aside from a, a lot of the other people. Without Carl, I think music could have been drastically different today. There have been maybe, you can count them on one hand, a handful of guitarists who were true innovators and developers of, of a style, of a new style of music and, and more specifically guitar playing. You've got people like Segovia, Django Reinhardt, Jimi Hendrix, and Eric Clapton and Carl Perkins and people like that. They're just so very few who were really, really developing something entirely new, never heard before. And uh, Carl has to be included in those. There was no rock and roll before Carl Perkins, in my opinion. He, he was, I refer to him as a godfather of rock and roll. There was some more there with him, but, you know, Blue Suede Shoes speaks for itself. Well, you can do anything for me, awesome. Carl Perkins and a young Elvis Presley were making music at Memphis's famous Sun Studios at the same time in the mid-50s. Elvis had good looks, got some good breaks, and went down in history as the king. His friend Carl molded his own place in history, combining average looks with above-average talent and fighting one bad break after another. Both men drew from southern gospel and black blues in creating their own style of music. But while Elvis went off to Hollywood to sing ballads and make movies, Carl kept Rockabilly alive at home in Tennessee. I was born April the 9th, 1932. I had an older brother who was uh, two years older than I. His name was Jay. I had a, a brother, Clayton, that was uh, almost three years younger than I. So I was trapped in the middle of uh, three little Perkins boys that grew up uh, very poor. The Perkins family worked a large cotton plantation near Tiptonville, just miles from the mighty Mississippi. They were the only white family on the plantation other than the owners. Carl was exposed to two cultures growing up and steeped in two distinctly different types of music. I was a great admirer of Ernest Tubb. Uh, before then, Bill Monroe. And in the cotton fields, I started listening to the black people singing. And there'd sometimes be 40 to 50 people strung out across them cotton rows, and I can hear an old black man that I, I loved him so much, then and still. Uh, John Westbrook was his name, and Uncle John would go, uh -huh, and about eight or 10 rows over Sister Juanita would say, oh, yeah. Little chill bumps would start up on that little Perkins boy's arm. I said, oh, they're going to sing. The only thing that would influence Carl's music more than that glorious singing was the intricate guitar moves Uncle John shared with him. And I said, Uncle John, what you doing with that thing up there? He said, you make the string quiver, little Carly. That's where I, I just automatically started doing that. I started kicking my strings back with my fingers because I, just out of the love of that old tired black man, he, he just caused me to uh, want to play so bad. His first guitar was fashioned out of an old cigar box and a broom handle. His first real guitar was a gift from Uncle John and Carl's first performance came in school as the only guitar player in Miss Lee's fourth grade marching band. I think she felt sorry for me knowing I was, you know, underprivileged. And uh, I remember when she asked me, 
would I like to play guitar in the band? I said, well, I'm not that good, Mr. Lee. Mr. Lee, I said, I, I don't know whether whether I can or not. I, 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 I'll try. But I said, i got a problem. She said, what's that? I said, I, I don't have a white shirt and white pants and shoes like the other kids do. She said, but you will have. And about a week later, she came to school and had a package. I took it home, and there was my wife's clothes. And I think a lot of the boys uh, knew that uh, she got them for me. Things like that kind of hurt you, but if you don't watch, you, you, you sting a little kid sometimes and, and, and move him. And that did me. I'm not going to have to live in Lake County all my life and, and drag a cotton sack. This guitar will get me on the Grand Ole Opry. I said that when I was less than 10 years old. And my brother Jay used to say, hey, Carl, you over-dreaming. You don't really think you're ever going to sing on the Grand Ole Opry, do you? I said, sure, I am. He said, you better be thinking about learning how to drive a truck or a tractor. Nobody from Lake County ever sang on the Grand Ole Opry, and it ain't going to be you either. Carl left Lake County, but the Opry wasn't where he went. Instead, the family moved near Jackson, 70 miles east of Memphis. Jobs were better, and so were Carl's chances of making his music. At age 14, he formed a band with Brother Jay fumbling his way around rhythm guitar. Soon, he added Brother Clayton, slapping out a beat on a beat-up, two-string stand-up bass. The music they learned to make together was as spirited as the three boys were different. Jay was quiet and gentle, but a strong boy, who the younger Perkins didn't much travel with. Clayton was rambunctious, would rather goof off than work and would never walk away from a good fight. Carl respected Jay and stood up for Clayton. He loved his brothers equally, and he loved his music. We went to town one Saturday, Jay and Carl and I, to a music store, and I bought an amplifier and a pickup for a guitar that I still have, and we all had a date that night, and when we got home, well, Carl plugs up the amp, and gets a guitar and he didn't go on the date. Jay and I had to carry all three girls to the show that night. He stayed home, played his guitar, or played them. He wouldn't go and he was dedicated then. And I think still is, if you hand him a guitar, he'd rather play than to talk. He'd rather play than talk and liked getting paid for doing it. That's when Carl discovered the world of honky tonks. When I started playing the first night I remember very well uh, my mother rest her soul she used to say boys don't play in them honky tonks don't waste your music in there sing in church and I said mama we've tried that and we can't even make string money they won't pay us we can, we, we can make some money playing these clubs if, we, if people will come to see us well the first few nights uh some of the the old drunks around the bar and get up and walk out. You know, I've seen them do that. But then it it wasn't really that long till uh, people started coming around to hear this new music. The other country bands were doing, it, but we were we were you know we was in another gear. The honky tonks fueled Carl's musical ambitions. The occasional drink he took there fueled something else entirely. There'd be both a high and a low road in Carl's long career. He took his first step down both in those dark, smoke-filled tonks. Well, let me take you to the movie, Mag, so I can hold your hand. It ain't that I don't like your house, it's just that doggone man. Double barrel behind the door, it waits for a call I know. Climb up on old Becky's back and let's ride to the picture show. Movie Mag was the first song Carl Perkins ever wrote. 
It celebrated a girl he once knew in Lake County. By 1949, he'd met and married the real girl of his dreams, Jacksonian, Valda Kreider. When I first saw her, there was something special about her. Uh, she's not the prettiest thing in the world, but she was so sweet. And she's pretty enough to me, I tell you, even today. It, it, it was not really the, what she looked like. It was that she was, she was a good listener, and, and she'd brag on my singing. The first time I met her, I sang a song for her, and it, it's lasted 44 years. Right from the start, Valda was Carl's touchstone, his tower of strength. She encouraged him to make his music as they made a family. But as well known as he and the brothers were on the talk circuit, his earnings were barely enough to survive on. Carl had even been writing songs and mailing them out to record companies. To his dismay, they were coming back, unopened. Then in 1954, Carl and Valda heard something on the radio that renewed their hope. There was a disc jockey, his name was Bob Neal. Bob said, I got a brand new record on a new label here in Memphis, Tennessee. The boy's name is Elvis Presley, Blue Moon of Kentucky. And then, you know, will, 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 I see a blue moon of Kentucky, won't you keep on shining? I had been doing that very song in the, the uh, honky-tonks around this town for at least three or four years. And I remember very well, my wife Val was in the kitchen and she hollered out to me, she said, Carl, that sounds like y'all talking about me and my brothers. I said, it kind of does, don't it? But in my soul, I knew it did. I knew that it was pretty close kin to what I'd been struggling with for all these years, see. And I set my sights on Memphis and down there we went. Memphis was the home of Delta Blues, and a radio executive named Sam Phillips, who was recording guys like Ike Turner and a fresh-faced Elvis Presley. In October of 1954, the Perkins brothers showed up, unannounced, at Phillips' Memphis recording service. By sheer luck, they ran into the man they went to see in the parking lot and pleaded for an audition. They got it, but it didn't go well. Jay had done the singing, and Phillips wasn't impressed. In desperation, Carl took the mic and did his Lake County special, Movie Mag. He said, hey, uh, can you stand still and, and sing that song? I said, well, yes, sir, I guess I could. Uh, he said, well, if we made a record of that, you'd have to stand still. So I, I, I nailed my feet to the floor and sang it. He said, go home and write you another one, and I'll, I'll put a record out on it. He said, I like that song. And man, that was all it took. I must have, I wrote two or three songs on the way back to Jackson. I went in the house and I said, Val, I'm half there. I started crying. She said, didn't I tell you? I told you. I said, you sure are right. Movie Mag became the flip side of his first record, Turnaround. And in February of 1955, Carl Perkins heard himself sing on the radio for the very first time. The Perkins brothers were still playing the talk scene to help pay the bills. But the rough crowds and late nights were wearing on them. Carl increasingly resorted to nipping bourbon to get his nerve up. Clayton, on the other hand, didn't seem to mind the talks. He was in his element. When a scuffle would break out in the club, which they would pretty, pretty often, Clayton would slam that old fiddle down and jump out in the middle of it. And I, I would tell him, I said, now listen, you can't do that. You're going to get hurt. Plus, we got to keep playing. We found out that when they started, when they started the fights, I just reason turn that amp up a little bit, get the music louder than the crowd, and they settle back down. From the start, 
From his vantage point on the stage one night, Carl saw a guy chastising his date for stepping on his new suede shoes. His friend and label mate Johnny Cash had once suggested blue suede shoes as the topic for a song. But it took this quarreling couple on the dance floor to trigger Carl's imagination. Go, cat, go, but don't you step on my blue suede shoes. You can do anything but lay off of my blue suede shoes. Sam Phillips was initially reluctant to market Carl as a rockabilly artist. He already had one in Elvis and preferred Carl's more country-oriented sounds. But selling Elvis's contract to RCA in November, he was now free to cut loose all of Carl's rockin' energy. He sold Elvis to RCA Victor. And then he told me, he said, all right, you're my, you're my man now. I want you to record the kind of music you love to do. And uh, that's, I already had put down a song called Honey Don't. Then I came up with Blue Suede Shoes, and uh, he put those two songs on the same record. And the rest is the life and times of Carl Perkins. <laughs> To me, rockabilly music, I mean, is is like the ultimate American music. And you know, without Carl and uh, and rockabilly, and that was that was punk music in the '50s. I mean, it was shocking. It was it was tough. It was uh, edgy stuff. And it, it, the amazing thing is, it's still that way today. By February of 1955, Blue Suede Shoes had become a monster regional hit and was climbing its way up the national charts. Elvis with his Heartbreak Hotel and Carl were swapping the number one spot week to week. Carl had never consciously set out to compete with the good-looking boy from Mississippi. But back when both were still on Sun Records and touring together, Carl saw firsthand the mighty power public opinion wielded. Uh, I remember a little town called Amory, Mississippi, that when Elvis came on, they were hollering, we want Carl, we want Carl. And it, it really hurt me. I stood beside the stage and I said, oh, please, please don't do that. This boy's never heard that in his life. Two nights in a row that happened, and uh, I never did another show with Elvis. It didn't make me feel that good. Because I thought, when I first saw him, I, I thought there's no way to keep this boy from being the biggest thing in the business. He's got it all. He didn't look like Mr. Ed. I had that problem. You know, I came out ugly. I'm bad ugly. And to be on stage with a, 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 a cat that looked like Hollywood before you ever knew where California was, I knew he had all the assets. Elvis may have looked more like Hollywood, but Carl's star was every bit as much on the rise. The Perkins brothers had been booked on their first national TV show in New York and were en route. Then the stars began to fall in on Carl Perkins. I was on my way to do Perry Como show March the 22nd. I already had signed for the Ed Sullivan show the following week and the TV exposure was fixing to happen and it would have been the right time for me to uh you know cash in on my hit record but it, that wasn't to be about daylight on march the 22nd we uh the driver who was driving my barred car uh hit the back of a pickup truck it killed the driver of that truck and I was out of commission. I had a fractured skull. I had a broken shoulder. It was cut very bad, uh, over 50% of my body. And it was during that time I was laying in my hospital bed when Elvis was on uh, the Jimmy Dorsey show. He said, I'm gonna do my new record. And he, he did Blue Suede Shoes. 
and uh, I knew then, you know, that that was that was going to stop me. It wasn't until Elvis's death that Carl learned the King didn't want to cover blue suede shoes. Elvis told his producers the song was his friend Carl's, and he didn't want to take it away from him. Only after Carl had hit number one with it did Elvis reluctantly agree to record the song. But that still was enough to steal Carl's thunder. Here I lay in a cast from my waist up. Could not move my chin. I had a fractured neck in this deal, too, with a busted skull. And I lay there looking at the roof of the hospital as my wife, Val, was back home about to have another child. Uh, me and the good Lord had some talks. I said, God, you gave it to me. Did you take it away from me? Is this it? Am I going to get well? Is my brother going to die? Oh, one man has already died. I didn't get to be on my television show. So am I going back where I started? The outpouring of love and support from public went a long way in helping to soothe Carl's pain. Elvis had even sent a telegram from the road conveying his concern and best wishes. As Carl convalesced, Elvis became a household word. Instead of Carl being the one to go up, Presley was. Not that Presley wouldn't have done it anyway, certainly he would have. But Carl would have been the first, the first one really. And he was in the hospital while his record was selling a million copies. How would it have changed things in the long run? I don't know. I think they both had their impact. Maybe things worked out uh, the way they were supposed to. The next few months saw Carl on the men, both physically and emotionally. His brother Jay had also been injured in the crash badly, but he too was healing, though the neck injuries he suffered would cause him pain the rest of his life. It was one of the great ironies of Carl Perkins' life that after a car wreck stunted and nearly ended his career, Sam Phillips presented him with a Cadillac for being Son's first artist to sell a million records. In August of that year, he also received his first royalty check, $12,000. He split it with his band, put a down payment on his first house, and for the first time in his life, opened a savings account. Friends, here he is. Very nice to have Carl on the show. Carl Perkins and the trio stepping out in their blue suede shoes. That fall, he finally made the Perry Como show. Well, it's one for the money, two for the show, three to get ready. Now go, cat, go, but don't you step on my blue suede shoes. Jay hid his pain wearing a special brace that allowed him to stand and play. Clayton was Clayton, ever mischievous and energetic. And Carl was gracious, but he knew that the parade of rock and roll was starting to pass him by, by no fault of his own. He never again topped the charts like he did with blue suede shoes. Alcohol began to play a greater role in his performing and writing, not so much to hide bitterness, but to numb the pain of disappointment and loss. My career really suffered, but then I backed off, and I got to thinking, you may never reach that level. I don't think I ever belonged there. And I accepted where I was, what I was, and that I still had a life. It's not what we lose in life. It's what you have left and what you do with it. But it's a how, girl, you say you will when you won't. Tell me that you do, baby, when you don't. Put your arms around me, let me know how it feels. Tell the truth, it is love real, but I'm uh -uh. I don't think there's anybody else that can write a song as quick and as easy as Carl Perkins. You know, he can be riding down the highway and 10 seconds later he's got a song that everybody's going to hear for the next 40 years. Oh, honey, don't. Oh, right songs fell out of Carl's head like kernels from a seed bag. 
Many were written as he played on stage. But with Sam Phillips now spending increasingly more time on the careers of Johnny Cash and son upstart Jerry Lee Lewis, Carl felt that Sam wasn't releasing his best material. He'd been loyal to the man who'd given him his start, but with no hits on the charts and feeling overlooked, Carl left Sun in 1958 for Columbia Records in Nashville. He fulfilled his childhood dream of picking guitar on the Opry, but it would be one of the few joys he'd experience in Music City. I think in the case of Carl Perkins, the biggest mistake I ever made in my life, I couldn't, I shouldn't have found any reason big enough to take me away from Sun Studios in Memphis. That's the environment I should have stayed in. That's where, if there was to be any more shoes, records, that's where they would have come from. And I look back after I've left there, I went into the Nashville scene and, and they put great players, but they wasn't rockers. Uh, I got mixed up in them big studios with people that didn't understand rockabilly music trying to record me and uh, I think, it's, I think I suffered from that. Carl's despair grew. Producers had him record more of other people's songs than his own, and often not even play guitar on his own records. He'd break a song onto the charts only to see it disappear in a matter of weeks. All the while, Elvis was going strong on the charts and the silver screen. As badly as things were going, nothing would shake Carl's world more than the death of his brother Jay in October of 1958. I knew that Jay wasn't well. And even when we did the Perry Como show, the old soldier stood there with his brace around his neck and a twisted smile. And you'd never know that he was in so much pain. And he wouldn't have went through that kind of pain if he hadn't have loved his brother Carl, so he wanted me to sound like my record. That's, that's kind of a love you cannot buy. It was diagnosed as uh, brain cancer, but uh, I, lost a, I lost a jewel of a brother when, when Jay left. The Perkins brothers went on without Jay. Both continued drinking. Only one would handle it better than the other. Clayton cared just about all the time he wanted to stay drunk. And I, I was told by dear friends of mine, like Ernest Tubb, he said, Carl, and boys are going to cause you a lot of trouble. Uh, Red Foley, bless his heart, I played a show with him. The last show that Clayton ever worked with me, uh, he hit Red Foley and knocked him down. And I grabbed him, and I I knocked him out, my own brother, to keep from having to fight him and hurt him. I just, I didn't hit him with nothing but my fist. But I, I got some extra strength. I laid him in the back of my car in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I drove straight to Jackson, Tennessee. And I brought him back to mom and daddy's house. I said, Clayton, that's it. You can't go anymore. For the first time in his career, Carl Perkins stood alone on stage, not quite sure what direction to take. He almost gave up his music and returned to farming. Almost. It was 1964, and with a well-timed phone call, Chuck Berry convinced Carl to cross the Atlantic and tour England with him. And there was a group called the Beatles who had a big record in America at that time, but they had not been to America yet. And uh, they gave a party for uh, Chuck and I, and uh, I can never thank Chuck enough. He didn't show up. <laughs> so I had all four of them little cats asking me questions about my music and songs. And uh, I, got, I made really good friends with those guys and uh, still am. Carl Perkins was a god to the Beatles. They'd buy his records and slow him down to learn the words and chord progressions. Eventually, 
they'd record three Perkins songs. Matchbox, Honey Don't, and Everybody's Trying to Be My Baby. 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 Everybody's George Harrison, the first time that I met him, of course, I was really excited being a Beatle fan. And, you know, after uh, a few minutes after I had met him, I just stepped back and, and looking at the situation, and I thought, man, here I am in awe of George Harrison, and George Harrison was looking at my dad the same way I was looking at him. And I thought, you know, this is really a trip right here, you know? After returning from England, Carl accepted his friend Johnny Cash's offer to join his band. Johnny had initially given him the idea for Blue Suede Shoes. Carl reciprocated by creating the music for Johnny's big hit, A Boy Named Sue. Johnny and Carl shared not only a common past at Sun Records, but a common struggle. He reportedly made a deal with Johnny that neither would touch liquor or pills so long as the other didn't. The bottle had been at every turn in Carl's career. In 1968, it almost took him down. I thought I was dying on the beach of California. I'd been drunk for three days. And I said, God, if you let me get home, let me see my wife and children, let me put my arms around my babies, I, I'll go, I'll go then. Please don't let me die out here. I got scared. I can't really say how much damage it did to my songwriting. To me, as a performer, I'm only proud that I can share with the world and any little picker out there. Alcohol cannot play. It cannot write a good song. It won't do you no good to, be, to have it in you out there in front of your fans. Hit the stage as yourself. And watch what you lean on. In 1975, Carl Perkins decided it was time to leave Johnny Cash, venture out, and once again be his own frontman. He did so with renewed purpose and a new act. It included his youngest and oldest sons, Greg on bass and Stan on drums. I lost two of the best players that a man ever had and my brothers. I came right along. God gave me two sons that equally uh, are better players than, than they were. But to have them boys on the stage with me built a brand new fire. It means everything in the world to him. I don't believe he would play without those boys. I really don't. It just seems like at every time, something's been, that knocked me down, something's replaced it that was better than, than what I had. Not what I had, but a little better. Our first show was uh, with Willie Nelson in Alexandria, Louisiana. We played to like 6,000 people, and you're talking about scared, man. I know I was. I was scared to death. And I'll never forget, Dad put us all together before we went on stage and had, had a little prayer because he knew that we were scared. You know, we was just young kids. My brother and myself and the, the other couple of guys that were in the band. And uh, he's the type of dad that I would never think that I could ever fill those shoes, that I'm just lucky enough to, to walk in the tracks. Uh, I'm in awe of his talent. Uh, I'm in awe of his humbleness. And he's, uh, he's just a good, good, solid man. My, my father's been dead for years, and uh, I kind of look on Carl as a fatherly figure now. And a great impact he's made on me is uh, 
he's a godly man. And I, I'm not saying this in the sense that I'm trying to give you a religious testimonial. I'm telling you the truth. And it's, it's rubbed off on me. In the early 80s, Carl read a newspaper article about an abused child. It haunted him for weeks and became the genesis for the Jackson, Tennessee Child Abuse Center, which bears his name. As big as this country is, we only had three child abuse centers in America. This was number four. The real results started happening about uh, eight or ten years ago. When these kids that we first started seeing started marrying, now we're looking at second generation children. Those that were rescued when they were little, if you think that cat don't love his child, just look for a daddy going down the street with a good grip on that little boy's hand. And I can just about tell you, he knows what love is. When kids come up to Carl, the uh, change uh, in his uh, in, in his just demeanor is just miraculous. He just uh, he, he lights up, and he he enjoys so much visiting with children. But he'll spend all the time, and if he gets to talking to a child, you just as soon to get comfortable because he's going to be there for a while. From telethons to public concerts, his service to his home community is extraordinary. Beating throat cancer in 1991 only strengthened Carl's resolve to keep living and giving. Today, I look in the mirror at 65 years old, and I don't have to look but a minute. So the fellow I see has been one of the most blessed human beings that ever walked on this earth. I wouldn't have traded places with Elvis. I wouldn't have traded places with Johnny Cash, who started there, Jerry Lee Lewis, Roy, none of these guys. Stumbling blocks are always there. But it's, it's what you do with them. It's, it's, it's using them. It's turning them babies around and, and, and getting up and walking again, you know, by playing my music, by having as many friends as I can have, by having the same woman 44 years and four children that's not ashamed to say Carl Perkins is my daddy. That's, that's it, you know, that's, that's the highlight. On the Isle of Montserrat, no, I never shall forget just a country boy a guitar and a song. I don't know if Carl Perkins has gotten his deal in a lot of ways. He, he definitely has from musicians. There's not a guitar player, uh, you know, worth anything who doesn't know Carl Perkins and know his playing and probably sat down and worked out some of his solos. But I think for, uh, for the general public, maybe he hasn't. And, uh, you know, it's about time. That's the roots, that's the real thing that the tree grew from. And uh, you have to, you have to acknowledge that, you have to appreciate that that's where it all started from. And uh, what rock and roll is now, he started it all out. I think he's had more than his share of bad breaks, beginning with that car accident. But I think the last few years have really turned around for him, even though it, it may be considered late in his life uh, by some people's ruler. Uh, I think Carl's very grateful for it and very happy to see it coming, and I think he's ready for it. Some 500 songs after he began writing, 40 years, nine grandchildren and two great-grandchildren later, Carl Perkins was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He still plays over 120 dates a year and always remembers what Uncle John Westbrook taught him about his very first guitar. Just make it vibrate, Carly. I've only brought out of the Lake County cotton fields two things. 
One was an old beat-up way of trying to play my music. Different. And another was I wanted friends. Nothing matches the feeling of walking down the street in any city that Carl Perkins goes and speaking to people, have them speak back to me. I cannot have too many friends. Another blue suede shoes might have made me not care about people. But I do. And that makes me happy. That makes me happy if, I'm, if I can just think, did I step on anybody today? And it's awful good thought to say, no, you didn't, Hoss. Get up tomorrow and, and, and do it again. If we never meet again this side of life, in a little while over yonder where it's peace and quiet i just like for the world to know that i tried tried to be a decent man a decent friend an average picker but i hope god's proud of me that's the main thing oh friend 